Yes, yeah, so we're kicking this off with a question we wanted to ask all of you. And that is, have you ever heard of the access to justice tech principles? And be honest, um, it's yeah, whatever your answer is, that's okay. I'll tell you, I had never heard of them until after I was on the access to justice boards tech committee. Uh, so yeah, we'll give you all a couple minutes, to, a minute, moment to answer that. And see here. I believe if we go to the next slide, we'll see the results. Excellent. Lots of you have not heard of this today, which is exciting because that means we get to actually explain things today and teach you something new. Um, CLEs are just telling you things you already know would be rather boring. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover what are the access to justice tech principles. We're going to cover their history. We're going to talk about why we updated them recently. That's why we're doing the CLE. And we're also going to go over what the principles are. So beginning with, what are they? The access to justice tech principles are a set of principles around our justice system on how technology should be used, implemented, and built to build a more inclusive justice system. And these principles are laid out for mostly court and court systems to follow as they adopt new technologies, approach new technologies, think about ways that they can incorporate them. So let's get into the history a little bit. And sorry, I'm gonna turn it over to you for that. So the history of the ATJ Tech Principles um, is that a group of individuals um, got together and noticed that a rise of new technology was coming forward in 2004 that would drastically affect our uh, way that we interact with the courts. Um, mobile phones uh, were present at the time. Skype was just getting started. They had about 15 uh, million users at that point. Um, it was the first year that Facebook uh, was launched. And to be honest, the people dealing with 2004 had no idea what social media um, would be. Um, but also Washington Law Help started to become the primary resource for people to find legal information here in the state of Washington, uh, put together by Northwest Justice Project. In 2004, a group of individuals that included uh, Richard Zorza, Don Horowitz, help from Mary Fair, Justice Mary Fairhurst, um, got together and did a series of community-based focus groups to ask the community about how technology would affect them and try to come up with a set of principles for adopting new technology. It had a heavy focus visuals rights, the safety that is related to individuals uh, when they're putting information online, but it also brought up that for several individuals, um, just access to that basic technology is not something that an individual necessarily has. And directly after 2004, um, which was the end of a two-year process of doing focus groups and writing up a series of principles, um, Justice Fairhurst uh, oversaw a, a committee on the implementation of these principles, trying to take these principles out to conferences, talk to people about them. And over the next 10 years or so, there was a lot of effort to educate people about the principles, to work with Administrative Office of the Courts as a partner, so that when new technologies were adopted, they considered things such as how would a member of the public access their own court record? Uh, for example, originally when the JIS system, which has started to move across the superior courts here in the state was put together, there was no opportunity for a pro se advocate to log into their family law case and get access to their own files. Uh, because of the ATJ Tech principles, along with uh, working with the clerks and AOC, the ability for a pro se to create an Odyssey account and access their own file um, was put together through that process. It was really about trying to strategically think about new technology that was coming forward and how we can include as many stakeholders and create the lowest number of new barriers with this technology. 
although things have drastically changed since then, this was also the first in the nation for the Washington State Supreme Court to sign these 2004 principles. And other um, organizations, both governmental and non-governmental, looked at those principles and worked forward adopting their own. So why do we really need an update if they were so good back in 2004? I think there's a series of things to think about here. Yeah, and Claudia, is there anything you want to add to the history since you were also part of that original creation of this? Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry I'm not able to be on the video having technical issues. <laughs> this is what technology should not do, but an example of technology being open to everyone is that I can log in on the phone, so there's many doors to justice. I was in California when the when the first uh, sec, uh, the first set of principles was released, and uh, it was really groundbreaking, really, to see a court, to see a Supreme Court, to actually um, ratify the technology principles in 2004. It was it was a breakthrough. It was something it had never been done. And um, I remember I was at the self-represented litigant conference, um, one of the very early ones um, in California, in San Francisco, and these principles were shared and discussed. And uh, that's what it really, it not just, it, it, just it, it really blew everybody's mind, and it was perceived as a really good idea. So um, I know that other states move to do this. I know California had a whole working group to kind of say, hey, we should do this too, because at that point, a lot of courts were already looking to go away from their, um, what do we call them, legacy systems, and really, you know, software as a service was starting to become uh, popular and understood. And so there were great concerns about, you know, terms of use and privacy and what are those vendors going to keep. And remember that everything was kind of marketing-driven, data mining for marketing-driven. So um, these principles kind of were the first attempt to, to lay out a foundation based on fairness. And so we've redone them, and we're going to share with you how much fun it was to redo them, how much community input. Um, because, you know, technology has, has greatly advanced and our culture around technology has also advanced. And so they were redone. Yeah, so, we, you uh, know, when we talk about technology oh, and, and why updating it, you know, there's, you can probably imagine that anything we did about technology in t 2004 in a pre-YouTube world is probably not as relevant, but there are a couple of specific things that really emphasize the importance of why we needed to update that now. And so I'll pass that over to you, Sard. Yeah, one, one of the big things that the original technology principles didn't really comprehend or even have any idea of was the rise of artificial intelligence in decision-making processes. Um, we've seen through ProPublica studies um, that uh, algorithms that are designed around sentencing um, can end up being um, biased in what is put forward. Decisions that would classically be made by um, an attorney or a surgeon, some of those things are, uh, there are companies out there that are trying to make those decisions via AI, and that is um, a whole new set of technology. Um, surveillance culture, the amount of information that we are gathering about each other, the amount of information that is available in a court case, uh, the amount of information that is available at a protest. Uh, there are groups that are collecting that information and using that information um, in the legal system. Um, the AI example specifically with regards to sentencing um, has shown that um, you you can codify um, the racism of past decisions, put that into an algorithm, and then people um, unfortunately view that because this was done by a computer in some cases that it's non-biased, where when we actually look at the results of what comes out of um, those algorithmic-based decisions is they've really just codified our choices in the past and our previous racism. As we add technology, we really need to think about the cultural effect of that technology and whether we are codifying the past, uh, which we do too often in law, or creating new systems that increase equity. Uh, smartphones basically even, did, yeah. 
I was just going to add, even when we don't codify the past, right, even when we build things now, we have to think about who we're including in that building process of things now. And one good example I can give of this is with the recent states that have tried to do an online bar exam using ExamSoft, they've had to use facial recognition to try to identify cheating. And what they found is that their facial recognition, not because it was created historically, but because of the people that they were in, were involved in that process, this could not recognize a lot of people of color's faces. And so people were, it, it, it was impossible for them to log into their bar exam because this algorithm that was created with modern data could not recognize their face. These things that, you know, it's not just, so it's not just about past justice. It's also about how we build things right now. We have to think about these things in these processes. And can yeah, I add I the database or the sample sets that you pull to create and train these machines, they're grossly mis misrepresented, uh, you know, of a different, uh, for example, just simple, if you voice some, build something on voice recognition, the sample sets that are available are from the Midwest. And those those are the actions that are recognized. Somebody like me, I can never do online banking without really um, becoming extremely frustrated because I don't have a Midwest accent. So the data samples that are being used, and these are robust samples, right, libraries that people have access to and purchase uh, or get through GitHub, those databases are not representative. And so you're training machines on, like, a sliver or a percentage of um, – who is in our country and who is using the technology and who is at the courts, and that excludes a lot of other people. So one uh, one quick thing I wanted to point out is thank, thank you guys for pointing out the typo there on the uh, racist algorithm um, slide. That was actually uh, my fault. And there was another question that came up that relates to that, which is on uh, disabilities and how we deal with disabilities and technology. I myself am severely dyslexic. Um, I took the bar exam orally after fighting with the Washington State Bar for two years to get that accommodation. Um, and having technologies in place that enable people um, is part part of one of the things that we really considered with these technology principles. Um, uh, the disability rights community was definitely one of the stakeholders for the new ones that are out there. Um, but uh, another point here, though, is that um, smartphones basically didn't exist in 2004. Our earlier image of the flip phone was one of the most modern phones on the market at the time. And s the access to information or the disadvantage for individuals who don't have access to a smartphone is something that was deeply considered in looking at these principles. Smartphones have changed the way that we practice law, changed the way that we interact entirely with the court system also. Yeah, and it's important to note that gap there, right? Some people do still have flip phones instead of smartphones, and that can create huge inequities in systems if people are getting, you know, text message reminders and they don't text people, right, um, from court systems, things like that. Or email, and they don't use I, – I have clients who don't use email who don't have an email address, right? Like it's – those can create – yeah, those can perpetuate systems pretty quickly. So – I think one of the – Biggest things that we it? learned from 2004 <laughs> that we moved forward into um, the 2017, 18, 19, when we did the revision of these principles was that focus groups with actual users was extremely important. That bringing in um, court users, um, both from internally, um, judges, administrative office of the clerks, the um, judicial bodies, but also end users, not just lawyers, but clients. Um, we did a series of focus groups in partnership um, with the University of Washington's Information School, and those focus groups looked at individuals from geographically diverse locations around the state, um, from migrant communities, from lower economic communities, and the feedback that we got from going out there and talking to end users was extremely valuable. I, I wish that all court rules that the, uh, that we put together um, had that type of focus group approach to it because the law applies to everyone. And in putting together these principles, we tried to make them as easy to apply to everyone as possible. And the focus group ap approach gave us a lot of feedback about that. Yeah, it's amazing how many things we changed once we got the focus group feedback on things. And I think it's such an important reminder because typically our justice system is built by lawyers who understand it and is built for lawyers who 
you know, rightfully improve the process by being involved in it. But the reality is it, a growing number of people, currently the vast majority in civil litigation, are pro se. And so systems that aren't built to accept that and acknowledge that are not going to function for the majority of users. Anything you wanted to add to that, Claudia? Well, no, I think we're going to get more into that, like the importance of um, user, user-centric user um, technology acquisition and really being vigilant against them. Um, on 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 unrealized uh, biases on how they may impact the, the application of a technology in a large self-represented world. Yeah. So after um, this two-year process, which included um, going out to focus groups, uh, submitting a draft to the court, the administrative office of the courts uh, making comments on that and asking for it to come back for additional comments from um, the administrative office of the courts and the judicial community. Um, we did put together um, a series of, of recommendations um, that were eventually adopted by the court. And the purpose of this what you know why why we felt this is important i thought it was best stated by the preamble so i'm just going to put it up here but to make sure you don't all have to read it all i will actually just take a moment and go over this because it's really important to think about why we're here the responsible use of technology is central to providing access to justice for all individuals to that end we should develop and utilize the technological tools that increase and enhance access to justice these principles do not mandate new expenditures create new causes of action or appeal or modify any rule Rather, they advocate that the justice system decision makers carefully consider these principles whenever technology is purchased, planned, or implemented to avoid reducing access and wherever possible use technology to enhance access to justice. This is really important. It wasn't something we were forcing big changes. What we were saying, as we think about where our court systems go, we need to be considerate of these, these principles and recognize that in every new step, you know, if you go to emailing system and e-filing systems, there are trade-offs that help some and hurt others, and we have to be conscious of those and make decisions accordingly. Um, just to kind of highlight this, we should develop and utilize the technological tools that increase and enhance access to justice. That was our goal here. That was the point of these, is increasing and enhancing, right? So it's not just giving more people access to the courts, but it's making sure their interactions with the courts are actually better. And with that, we get into what these actual principles are, and we'll start with the scope. Claudia, what, what is the scope of these principles? Did we lose you, Claudia? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, the scope applies to courts, clerks of courts, administrators, office of the courts, court administrators. So, you know, it is it has a very concrete, basically anybody that's going to be making any major decisions either on how um, technology is purchased, how it's used, etc. So um, these are the folks that need to be reading this, but it, I think it, you know, it could be considered much broader. And um, the other thing is, you know, that this could be used, for example, the scope is to guide. Like it's not a requirement, like you must purchase this specific technology or anything like that. It's more of a guidance. And so, for example, if you're going to be purchasing, let's say, something like a, like a case management system, you could issue an RFP that asks questions about, you know, how does your system combat discrimination? How does your system combat unfair treatment of vulnerable communities? Um, are there any known biases in your system? Do you cover, um, do you provide, um, you know, accessibility accommodations through your e-filing system? Please describe. Do you provide language access? How do you accommodate, you know, the 66 in the, in the country, the 66 million that don't speak English? So you could use these principles to write your RFPs and to vet, to set your criteria for vetting RFPs. And it, it is very broad, too, because it just doesn't go to the technology itself, but it goes to, for example, accessing your records, uh, being able to access your records for free. It goes to how the data is stored. It goes to who it's, who it's shared with, like are you sharing this with data aggregators. These are all considerations where you have to be thinking, is there going to be an unjust bias that's going to then come and harm 
and communities that are working with the courts. So it is very, very broad. But it covers specifically courts, clerks of courts, administrators office of the courts, and court administrators. In terms of the definition of technology, you know, it is not just the, the boxes, the machines that you have, the servers. It covers, or just the software, it covers a lot more than that. And like I said, you know, storage and retrieval. Is the retrieval going to be super, super difficult? Will people have a really hard time retrieving? Are there going to be arbitrary barriers to retrieval? retrieval? Um, aggregation, again, are you going to be aggregating data? Does the user know? Who owns, does the user agree to that? Are you providing clear notification to people what you're gonna you, I, you're gonna do with the data? Are you gonna sell their data for you know those kind of things? So are you gonna share with a data aggregator and then that eviction is gonna be on record five years later? Is that you know those are the things that were that the principals are asking court administrators and court departments to think through. Dissemination, how are you sharing the availability of this technology, be it, um, you know, forms or ODR or anything else? How are you sharing that? Are you really going down to the public or is it just mostly internal? Uh, who is, um, who has access to this? And how is it being communicated? So it's a very broad um, definition of technology that goes beyond what we generally think hardware and software and then um, some cyber stuff. It's really thinking about the whole system from an end user perspective. Yeah, that broad is such a good point because, you know, it, in the scope we do mention, and, the, and each of these is titled by a subject, uh, each of these slides is a subject of the, or a, a title of one of the principles. And in the scope, you know, it says that it includes courts and clerks of the courts and administrators, but we also say that it, everyone involved in administering the justice system is included in that. So these are principles that we believe should also guide lawyers and pro bono organizations in their, in their you know, administration of their um, activities. So, yeah. Yeah. And so, Anything to add on that, Sart? Or, well, I I think from a from a practical perspective, though, we've uh, got some questions over um, how how like effective or kind of enforcement stuff here, and um, in dealing with um, especially with uh, judicial information. Um, Services Committee, JISC, the existence of the previous principles from 2004 had a heavy effect on some of the policy choices that were made and even some of the contract decisions that were made in the contracting uh, process. So letting stakeholders know about these in advance gives them something to think about. And having this extremely broad definition of technology, which we actually got help from University of Washington's information school uh, with, um, has helped show that it's important in every aspect of that kind of product lifestyle for technology there. Okay. And so um, access to justice for all? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I was access just going to say, what do you have for us, Claudia? We're going, we're, going, we're going Bill of Rights. I mean, we're going fundamental access to justice for all. And what we really mean by this is that we want those that will be making decisions about what technology to use with the public is that we want them to think about, um, you know, is it equitable? Is, you know, is, if, is there going to be access to this from everywhere and anywhere by income, by race? They at least need to ascertain that. It could be that the solution, right, no solution is going to be 100% perfect. But if it's if it doesn't offer that, and there are things that are not going to be, you know, they're more like, for me, I'm in eastern Washington, we don't have as much broadband as, as, as you guys have in the west side. Still, right, uh, there's got to be a different way of getting in. Does that service or that capacity provide a different way so that we're not leaving people out because they cannot afford to have, um, you know, reliable, uh, fast Internet? Um, opportunities for participation. How does the tool let the individual uh, comment or provide feedback? Feedback is super important. Are they even collecting it? Do they have mechanisms to let you do that? Um, do they have tech support? And how do they address that if an issue is happening? Are they responsive? Um, and if, you know, because with technology, if there's an issue, it's going to replicate very fast. Like it could happen a thousand times in a minute depending on how big the volume is. So um, 
how are they going to fix it? How, you know, if it's an algorithm, how fast is it going to take for them to, like, review the, the, the issue and then, um, and then address it? Those are important questions to ask when you're making these choices or deploying new systems. And then, you know, that goes back to transparency, really not just trusting. You know, a vendor it could tell you. Some vendors will t- tell you stuff just to sell you the pro- product. But, but as a court system, as a, as a pro bono group, as anyone that's in the administration of justice or providing justice, um, it's a transparent. So we really mean access for all. Are they really telling you how it's going to work for the you know disability community? Are they going to have captioning capacity? Are they is that really built or is that a new build? You know how transparent is the process going to be, and then how easy is it going to be once it's changed? If you're finding out that it's affecting um, you know Russian speakers in Spokane, how how fast you know that that option wasn't programmed for that language? How fast is it going to take to get that resolved? So it's justice for all, and really what the principle are after is to really try to do as much as you can to eliminate, you know, the discrimination and the unfairness. And, um, the, you know, the legal, the legal process is full of um, complications, and um, it's not an easy system to navigate for somebody that, that is a first-time court user. So what are the unjust biases, um, you know, in the underlying workflow? Can this system um, make those a little bit better, a little bit easier? So, or at least not build on those, right? Don't, don't make it worse. Um, so these are all parts of what's the access to justice for all. It's not just, um, you know, oh, yeah, I assume everybody has email. Yeah, I assume that it, or if people don't have email, they're going to have to do it by hand which is what's happened with e-filing in, in most states, right? You know, just assume people don't have an email account, well, they're not going to benefit from e-filing. We're going to have them come in. And I don't know what's going on now with um, with COVID, you know? So no, don't just say, oh, captioning, we don't have that. So anybody that needs captioning, they're not going to benefit from this tool. That's not the approach. The approach is, okay, well, then how can we accommodate them? Is there an alternative or can it be built? And then how would it be tested? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, you touched on this, Claudia. And I think one of the really important lines in these principles, and w- the principles are all in the materials, so you can read the full language of them. But it's that, you know, uh, the use of technology in our system should increase and must not diminish equitable access to the courts and usability and accountability. So there's that recognition that there are trade offs and saying that not every piece of technology can increase things, right? But there has been a real problem in the past in our history where technology tends to enhance uh, inequitable like issues in our country already. And so the recognition that like it's okay to have something that is neutral, but you must not diminish access through technology you're implementing, I think is really key to this. Mm-hmm. Anything you wanted to add, Sart? Yeah. All right. Uh, We're good on this openness, one. privacy, and safety. Um, so openness and privacy uh, were kind of originally looked at in the 2004 um, as two things you kind of needed to balance um, against each other. Um, and the re-envisioning of this looks at it much more broadly and adds the term um, safety, that there are uh, different reasons that you would like to protect information than just an individual's privacy rights. Um, and this has become uh, extremely true in the time of social media, uh, in the time of smartphones that are tracking where you are, in the time where submitting a photograph um, can have information on it that shows where a domestic violence victim is. Um, there, This needs to be considered uh, much more strongly than it did in the original 2004. It's always been a important part um, of the principles, uh, but as we share more information, it's extremely important to our clients especially. Yeah, anything you wanted to add to that, Claudia? No, I think that, you know, this goes back to transparency and things like that. If if a court system or a justice system is going to require a user to use a specific technology and there's a known risk, arguably, well, attorneys under the ABA model rules have to do a 1.2 thinking process because they also have attorney obligations. 
at what point is the if they think the risk is reasonable and this is not for courts this is for attorneys but courts could think through things like this and they have their own ethics that they should also consult but if there's a known risk to this particular tool is a reasonable is it a reasonable risk and if it is a reasonable risk if the benefit is so so good and it makes everything so easier for the end user for the courts for the clerks and everybody then is that risk um, shared with the user and does the user get to opt in or opt out and i think that that's where where a lot of times people are not really checking like kicking the tires of the technology that they're using and they're going by what you know it's being shared in public and i think that the bigger the investment and the more people it would affect they should really be um checking really checking and making sure that there if there's safety issues that everybody knows what those are and that then a group of thinkers and decision makers thinks about is that risk reasonable do we want to go this way particularly when it's completely new 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 technology or a complete new version of that technology you know because there are technology that has existed for like 20 years like um but you know a new a new take on that and so i would think that this is this safety part is probably becoming the most important one particularly since i said you know now everything can be merged into huge data sets by companies that are not regulated and that you don't want to inadvertently put somebody at risk um because you uh, because you and, and and then not have this claim that risk that would be like the worst case scenario yeah one example we can talk about with this uh, you know is that there were when states started using algorithms to you know predict recidivism things like that they were using private companies who said our algorithms are our private work product and we cannot disclose them they are trade secrets and so people were being sentenced on a basis that none of them had access to the information of how that decision was made you know you couldn't talk to the judge and say well explain your decision to me write out your opinion no they could not look behind the wall to see how these decisions were made on sentencing and bail reform like these private com technologies having this access could cause a lot of problems. That's one example of where this openness is really important so that people understand what the justice system is doing, how these decisions are being made, and they can feel like they're part of the process. Mm -hmm. And accountability and fairness, what do you have for us on this start? Uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but whenever technology is being used um, to make decisions, there needs to be a transparency to what's going on and some way uh, to review that particular decision. Uh, most of the egregious uh, violations of individuals' rights from computers um, have happened when you automate a system and then have it do things again and again, and there isn't an oversight or check um, to that. Uh, we've seen that definitely happen with state agencies trying to um, automate particular types of claims um, or tax related items and then having uh, rulings go out that affect people en masse with no easy way to appeal them. Uh, it especially happens when you teach a system to optimize um, for something that may not necessarily be within the user's best interest. Um, you can change uh, variables and look for ways um, to create extra tickets while at the same time um, compromising safety uh, by shortening the length of um, uh, red lights or yellow lights um, in between. Ha having a system that isn't audited and checked uh, means that you can end up with abuses around it. This is particularly difficult though in the AI area that we were talking about. Um, auditing machine learning algorithms and getting access to that is extremely difficult. It's, it's a new area that we're trying to study and understand. The principles don't have all of the answers in them and realize that technology is changing very quickly. But but accountability and fairness is one of those principles that needs to be upheld when implementing these new technologies. And I'm going to say you're... that I'm a woman of color in technology. There's very few of us. I probably can count us in maybe 10 fingers. So if decisions are going to be made about what's accountable and what's fairness, if I am looking at a room of um, mostly males, 
uh, probably majority white, though not necessarily. I would be very dubious about what they have decided is fair and accountable to, let's say, your client base um, that's going to be using and this particular tool is 70% women of color. You can't have a, uh, you can't have accountability and fairness if your teams are not represented, if the companies are not really um, testing their products and getting the feedback way before they come to you. So those are questions that you want to ask if you're going to be the decision making on acquiring a piece of technology. It's like how is that um, and diversity of uh, life experience and judgment goals. Because at the end, as much as you want to think about it, the parameters are set by judgment calls. And uh, those judgment calls, if they're not made through an inclusive group and they're not tested in the uh, communities that are, you know, nowadays most communities are super diverse, you really have to question the, the, the fairness of the system. And it gets back to the thing about user feedback, right? If you start deploying a system and you right away start getting information or feedback that is not working for a particular community, you cannot just say, oh, user error. They don't know how to use our fancy, sophisticated, nice, and beautiful system. And it's like an editor, right? You Sometimes you can't edit your own writing. You have to step step it up and say, okay, let's really review this and take this seriously and see where the trap for the unwary may be and is there anything that we can do on our system. As simple as it could be, you know, plain language or something to make it better for the users and review your tickets periodically to make sure that you're addressing those high volume questions. So it's a whole circle of um What's accountability and fairness and user feedback and who is making the judgment calls of what is fair? Yeah, and you know, one thing we talked a lot about in these principles, because I saw there was a question that was about, you know, who, how people who are involved affects this. And the reality is that, you know, we all do have unconscious biases. And that's one thing we wanted to make sure is addressed in this is that people are not just looking out for conscious biases built into the system, things that are apparent and obvious, but also thinking about the unconscious biases of who do you have involved in these processes, because that can change how things work. For instance, if you build a facial recognition facial recognition algorithm and you don't have enough people of color involved in that, it might not work when it comes to certain people of color. Um, and that can create a lot of problems in the system. So it's important to always kind of recognize what the limitations are on your own abilities to recognize your problems and involve stakeholders, right? This accountability and fairness also includes reaching out to those who are your users and who are the you know least involved of your users because you need to make sure that they are brought in and made involved so that they can be part of this in the future. Um, maximizing public awareness and use, kind of like what we're doing today. Um, so this principle is about the idea that the courts justice system should make everything as available to people as possible, right? You need to make people aware of the law if ignorance of the law is not an excuse for not breaking it. You need to make the law something that is available to all those in need. And one of the questions that was asked, asked about, you know, making things like uh, legal research more accessible to people, getting case law accessible to people without having to high cost for it, right? Costs are absolutely a barrier that is inequitable. And so, yes, as we're looking at technology systems in the courts, we actually have had conversations about accessibility of uh, legal research with um, the Access to Justice Tech Committee before because of the costs associated with it, that and how that causes a problem for a lot of users. And so with these principles, one thing we are talking about consistently is making sure that everything that is done is trying to maximize public awareness, maximizing their use, also making sure the public is aware of how the justice system works. and what the just like what the people who are using it need changed in them right listening to the public to figure out where the actual problems are one thing that happens a lot in any development world is that people start solving problems that may not actually be the problem and if they go back and look at things differently they realize oh the problem is something else and if i'd listened to people from the beginning i might have noticed that i can give an example from personal experience right um is we had a a lot of clients in our office calling us all the time and it was just taking up a lot of time. And so we made it easier for them to text us, to email us, to communicate by us without going through our phone tree, without talking to our receptionist time and call volume did not change. 
because we were solving our problem, not their problem. When we started asking them why they were calling and we found out that most of them were calling to figure out like if they had a benefit check arrive, we created an automated system to tell them when their benefit check was here and the calls dropped instantly. And it's because we got them involved to see what the actual issues were and how people are using it. So maximizing public awareness and public use is one of the key principles of this. And that takes us to, actually, I'll start, I'll just go back and say, Claudia, start anything you want to add on maximizing public awareness and use? Uh, that is really our challenge uh, moving forward, is how can we get these principles out there, uh, both to policy decision makers um, and to individuals to know what um, is possible and how the court system should be asking or acting. Yeah. Sorry. Claudia? Well, for me, in terms of maximizing public public use um, and awareness, like I said, I think that um, because the principles talk about the justice system. If you read the actual principles, it talks about justice system. So it's everyone, like like Sart or or, or you, Jordan says, pro bono groups, is legal aid, is uh, law libraries, it's uh, courts, right? So. They, you know, they have to um, also maximize public awareness and use so that if a tool is created with, um, you know, with um, nonprofit dollars or taxpayer dollars, that they also, you know, technology, believe me, you can create the most beautiful, elegant, powerful online form. But if you don't have an, um, an outreach plan, if you don't have... Uh, user feedback to keep making that better. If you don't maintain the technology, it will wither on the vine. It doesn't matter how expensive or how fancy the technology is. Any stakeholder that is bringing a tool that will increase access to justice and will make access to justice meaning, meaningful, because that we're talking about meaningful and not hurtful technology, if you are not maximizing public's awareness of those technology and tools and you're not maximizing use, then then what was the whole point of that? So I think that part of this is asking the justice system stakeholders that, you know, they also take um, an approach to share what's out there, to reduce the information gap, to reduce the trap for the unwearies, and, um, and and tell people, hey, there is this tool that we just released, and this is this is uh, this is uh, this is how you use it. There's feedback. We want to hear feedback, and that you do that not just in the first six months of release, that you put yourself in a mindset that you're going to be doing this on a routine basis, um, because if the tool really makes it more meaningful, then your core credibility will go up. People will be mad like that, you know, the courts, uh, let's say, in Benton County, in my county. They have that nice tool, and, and, and uh, it took me 20 minutes, and it was really clear. And there will be trust and confidence regained by the public at large. Um, so this, this goes to maximizing the awareness of these principles, and anyone that's going to be doing technology, reviewing and creating RFPs that ask some of the questions that these principles ask people to think about, but there's also that once you have the technology and the tool, getting it out there and not assuming, oh, we've created it, we've done this, we've done our part, and now it's going to sit on some website under 20 clicks. It's the users that are not finding it. It's not our problem. Speaking of usability, Sart, what do you have for us on that? I, it is essential that, as we've talked about earlier, testing things with actual um, users. Whenever we create um, a checklist or a video, uh, back when I was at Northwest Justice Project, um, we uh, started taking those videos um, and having clients look at those videos and try to implement these legal self-help steps um, that were part of that. And one of the things that jumped out at us, uh, we had a video where we used attorney and and then we also um, used advocate throughout it. And somebody wrote down on a list, oh, I, I need an attorney. I also need an advocate and I, and I need a lawyer. Um, and 
it was not clear to them that in some of these cases we were using these terms um, interchangeably, and that that was our fault. Um, we did not realize because we were so steeped in the language of how much legal ease goes into helping members of the public. And with each of these new technologies that are implemented, whether it's electronic filing, which I hope that every county uh, goes to at some point as an option, um, it actually needs to be tested with end users, uh, not just the people that have to use it every day. Anything you want to add to that, Claudia? users. Yeah, and I think that anyone that's bringing new technology should ask about that from anyone that they're considering, because generally the usability, I always tell people, okay, for an online form for every hour of developing the form, at a minimum, there has to be at least four hours of testing. That's just for a form, four hours of testing. That doesn't include, um, you know, surveys, end user feedback, and tech, tech box review of tickets, what are the tickets with the most volume. You know, you're in a constant improvement mode. And that's what you should be um, at as the user of technology and as the provider of technology. You should always be, like, on the lookout, like, what – you know, what are we getting back? Can we fix that? Can we make the system better? And so um, usability is, you know, you, if it's a product that doesn't have broad use and still in research and development, um, that's one thing. But if it's a product that's being presented to you as if this is a complete product, they should be able to answer those questions. How, you know, how have you done usability testing? And they should also be able to work with you to develop your own usability testing after you have deployed their system, there should be a period where they will work with you and, and helping you do your own usability testing because you've mapped those systems to your legal to, to your local legal conditions, and we know that law is very local and very fragmented. So how is it working now that this is applied, and can anything be made better? Accessible formats. Uh, this is something we got asked questions about, you know, people with disabilities, things like that earlier. And this is something that's key to that is that the law needs to be available in accessible formats to everyone. So whether that means you have transcriptions, you have different languages, the court information must be available. And that also includes, you know, people who are economically disadvantaged, having resources available for free for people that do not place an undue financial burden upon users, right? Uh, we have to make sure that it's accessible and also that, you know, the communication style that is being used is one that comports with how people actually act. One good example I can give of this is it's not a court example, but when I was in law school, I was on the uh, faculty committee for dealing with um, career services. And I remember communicating with them in a meeting at one point in time where they were saying, well, you know, we're trying really hard to communicate with everyone. We sent emails, we did these things, we did all these things. And they were talking about how no one showed up and, to these events. And I said, okay, I'm on your faculty committee and I didn't know about this. I don't care if you're using 20 different methods to communicate with us, what you're doing isn't working, so you need to change. And that's the key there, right? Is recognizing that just because you're, make, you're pushing things out there doesn't mean you're communicating in an accessible way. Accessible doesn't just mean that it is in the proper language. Accessible also means that it is in a format that is user friendly. Because if you're putting things out there in a way that is technically accessible, but no one is going to ever find, right? If it's, you know, second page of Google results, no one's ever going to look there. No one's ever going to find it. It is not actually an accessible format in that way. Uh, anything you wanted to add, Sart or Claudia? No, right. I mean, I think that the search engine optimization for any technology project is also a key thing to, to ask about or require or or um, figure out how you're gonna do that. It goes back to the more accessible it is, the more users, and hopefully the more community of users you will bring in and will benefit from the tool. So again, it's this circle, again, of vir you know, virtual circle of inclusion, no biases, meaningful data sets, feedback loops. It all works together very nicely and accessibility will bring communities that have not been able to um, to participate into that. And it's also making sure you're not creating arbitrary barriers. Like, okay, like if you can create, um, and a lot of this was covered in the self-represented 
um, litigants um, e-friendly e-filing in 2012. Some people may want to look at that too. But, you know, don't use things like waivers as a barrier. Like, if you're creating a form and you can program in there the waiver if the person wants to use a fee waiver, don't make that a barrier to, like, not use the e-filing. Figure out how you're going to fit in the people that need waivers, right? Because uh, particularly now, our economy, are, there's no jobs. A lot of people are going to need waivers. Uh, so don't don't use um, things like that as barriers. If, you know, accessing your court records, if you're the litigant, shouldn't those be free for everyone? If, if it's your own records, how, how you know, should, should the county ask for you to go and download your own records for a fee? So it should be accessible with, you know, the known ADA accessibility, but think about other arbitrary barriers that may be put on that may be able to be worked in a different way. So think about that, because what you want to do is reduce the barriers, and that could include um, income barriers, which probably will affect disabled people too. Yeah. All right. So plain this is one of my for us, favorite though. principles here, uh, plain language. It, I believe, is actually maybe the second um, shortest principle. Um, I put out the full text of the principle on here. Um, the justice system must strive to create legal information resources for the public in plain language when possible. Uh, huge huge believer in the need to take the law, remove a lot of the jargon that is actually not needed. In most cases, um, including judicial opinions, we can make them much more accessible. Yes, as lawyers, we have way too many years of education, and we like to prove that we have that education by using ridiculously inaccessible language. Um, I would like to see that practice removed, and the principles really go at the need for the law to be accessible to everyone in plain language is the first um, step towards that. I would, I'd love to even see the court rules re rewritten in plain language, which I know some people think are is crazy. But I also want to emphasize that this particular um, principle has the word must in it. There's must and there's shoulds throughout here, but this was one that people had a huge conviction about. Other thoughts on plain language? Well, plain language also includes icons, you know what I mean? It includes checklists. It's a lot about making it easy on the on the eye. And uh, just going to flag that there are icon libraries that have actually been tested during usability testing, like, like, we, like we were mentioning. And I'll reference uh, Future Trends in State Courts 2020. If you look that up, it's a magazine that's um, a journal that's published by the National Center for State Courts. And recently they had an article actually about the Washington law help icons that have just been added to law help that were created and that were tested. And they talked about how they tested those icons. So uh, iconography, you know, these, um, these icons that I'm referring actually – and Northwest Justice Project was generous enough to, to say, hey, yeah, sure, put them out so that any any nonprofit, anybody that's using this can have them available, and they're available at Trascend.net. So, you know, figuring out, you know, where are those resources? I mean, the, the benefit is that there's a lot of uh, generosity in the legal nonprofit community, and they have been taking strides to making – plain language, icons, checklists, really simplifying things so that the person can get from A all the way to the end of the alphabet. Um, and so make sure that you know where those things are. And so I'll flag Trascend.net because not only do they have the icons that were uh, featured in that journal piece, and you should read it if you're interested in testing icons, very good article, but you know they're available for download. Um, and then the other piece that they've done that I think was huge is that during COVID, you know, a lot of people who have never been on Zoom were being asked to be on Zoom with the courts, right, self-represented litigants. But the instructions were not helpful at all. And so Transcend actually took the instructions for Zoom and for Zoom with an interpreter and put them in plain language English and plain language Spanish. 
and uh, has made those available. And they said that those are available for any court or court system that wants to send or post instructions for the people that are going to be in the open dockets um, for those instructions. These are the kind of things that are expected, right? That if you're going to be moving suddenly a docket is going to go online and and it's going to be um, something that most self-represented litigants have not used. Um, you know, make sure that you put the instructions in plain language. Make sure that you put the checklist of how to get ready in plain language. Use iconography. So I offer those in case people want to check those out uh, because those may be helpful if you're moving online because of um, the pandemic. We don't know how long things may need to be remote, but also so that you can see how nice it can look. All right, best practices work group. This is a, a great thing that as part of these principles, a work group is to be created to assess technology and to provide tips for court administrators so they have someone they can go to to figure out, hey, we're trying to you know, figure this out. Um, what what can we do here, right? Um, and so that's like one of the nicest things about this is it's not just sending this off to the courts and saying, you need to do this. Here's, we're not offering you any help at all. We're creating a work group to have best practices so that they can advise the courts on this. And, you know, one of the questions we got was, you know, how can courts do this when they have limited resources? And part of that is that, you know, these principles don't require any new spins on technology, but what they do require is that if you are changing something, if you are spending money on technology, you need to think about these principles as you're implementing this new process. So it's not necessarily we're going to go back and fix everything now because that would be a huge spend. And as much as I'd love to raise our taxes to get that problem solved, I think most of the state probably disagrees with me. Uh, but what we can do is decide that from here on out, we are going to build a better future. And that's what these principles mandate, right? We say we should go back and fix these things, but we must for the future prevent things from being made worse or made, yeah, made any worse. Um, so that's really the key of the best practices work group. If any of you would like to be involved in this best practices work group, by the way, feel free to reach out to us after this. Um, you have all of our contact information. We could be more than happy to get you involved in this if you wanted to be part of this best practices work group. Uh, and also, um, Claudia, if you could repeat the article titles you were mentioning, that would be helpful for people. Yes, it's a future, future trends in state courts 2020. And it's about testing icons. And um, I believe Maria Midland was the author with Tanu. And um, so I can repeat it at the end when we get to questions. Let me just go look it up right now because I don't have the exact title in front of me. But it's in And um, that's where the icons are. That's where the Zoom instructions are. And probably the article is also linked there. But I'll give you the NCSE site. All right. Accessibility. Sart, what do you have for us? Uh, we've definitely talked about this in other areas throughout here. Uh, this principle specifically calls out that the justice system must consider, design, and implement technological systems for all persons, including those with disabilities. And I really want to emphasize how much less expensive it is to take a system from the beginning, take accessibility standards and implement it, than to go back and redesign a system later. Uh, there was some discussion over whether this should be in, um, included so explicitly, and we really just wanted to emphasize to those strategic um, stakeholders that doing this at the beginning is, is essential. It will save time and money over the long term and it will include more people um, in the justice system. Okay. So cultural responsiveness, I'll take the lead on this one. So cultural responsiveness really requires you to have um, a high level of self-awareness and the teams that are creating the technology but also the teams that are going to be using the technology have to be self-aware and I'll give you an example of a question that may seem seemingly neutral but it would be a high turnoff to anyone using that let's say that you're in a triage interview to see if you you you're, you want to see if you can get an order of protection or something related to a child. 
And, you know, there's a question about the child, and the question is seemingly neutral. It's meant to be, it's meant to elicit a particular, you know, basically it's trying to elicit whether they're in a relationship or not, but let's say that the question says, are you in a loving relationship? That that insertion of the word loving immediately brings a judgment, and it will impact a lot of communities, and a lot of groups of um, parents, where the child may be the product of um, trafficking or rape, or it could be in uh, some communities, you know, marriage is not a concept of being a parent. And so that could be a really big turnoff. And if you don't have somebody who has that, exp who, who, who has or knows that community, a seemingly neutral question could really impact the use of that tool and how people perceive your institution. This goes along with things about gendering, gendering. For example, parenting roles. You know, if you make it chatty, I know that at, at right now in a lot of chats and a lot of technology, everything is trying to imitate a human and make it fun. Sometimes with humor, you can go the wrong way. And so if they say you start talking about mom or dad or whatever, if you're assuming parenting roles by gender, you're going to be letting out a big community because not all families um, gender parental roles, even heterosexual couples. You know, there's not such a thing as a mom's job or a dad's job. And so you have to be really aware that you're serving everyone, not just the slice where you live, but everyone. So cultural responsiveness really has to be um, taken very seriously because it could really make your institution look really bad to a whole group of people. I often get the question of, um, and we're going to talk about language access, but is it better or not to put machine-translated text on a court website? And my question is, how can you ask that as a court? Like, do you know how awful you look to that language community? Like, would you even tolerate that in English? Imagine that you put some website or tool or something with really poor English grammar where it's not intelligible. If it's not okay for English, why is it okay for another language? And that's, and, and that's what cultural responsiveness. Imagine that that's the only language you speak and that's, um, or that's the culture that you're from. Or sometimes, you know, it can come also in the, in the context of appropriation. Like you may call your project some, some cool concept. Like I give, this is in the private sector. There was this um, product called Bodega, if you want to look it up. They were trying to basically have it. This is not in core technologies. This was pure, um, you know, capitalism, selling, selling grocery shops in little vendor boxes all over New York City, and they called it bodega. Because in, in New York, in the East Coast, there's a big concept of bodegas, which are basically the little Latino markets in the, like, you know, East Coast, Massachusetts, and stuff like that. They thought it would be cute. They never really even thought about checking or thinking about how that would disenfranchise the original bodegas that were that were there and that are kind of like the neighborhood hangout in many parts of these these um, urban areas. They had they ha they were out one day and the whole thing collapsed because there was so much backlash by the Latino community about the cultural appropriation of the name. So you have to be conscious also about like not culturally appropriating names or something just because they're cool or they're hip, um, you know, et cetera. Make sure that you are not culturally appropriating, that you're centering and that you're bringing stakeholders from those communities, you know, to make sure that if you're using a phrase or a concept that they use, like disabilities communities have some phrases like no no decision without us, um, I'm paraphrasing. But you know, if you're going to be using this, these languages that these communities use, make sure that, that you're checking in with people because uh, cultural responsiveness is very subtle. And if you all are in the same income group, from the same universities, from the same background, you're gonna really miss out. And you could actually really bomb the whole, the whole point of adopting the technology you don't want to ever have it to go bad so that's that's on that human touch uh this is something that's really important that you know people still do want interactions with human beings to some extent right even the chatbots we create that help people solve problems 
people want some sort of human character element to this. And so one thing that we wanted to make sure was addressed is that as we're pushing technology, it's not just shove everyone off into automated systems, it's that you have to keep that human touch so people feel heard and feel like they are being treated fairly and in a human way in the system, right? Um, so technology should be used to increase the level of quality and level and quality of human interaction uh, and to increase public satisfaction with the system, right? We don't want to have this automated system that everyone hates. Uh, one good example of this is in British Columbia, they have the Civil Resolution Tribunal, which basically took all of their small claims court and turned it into an online disaggregated system where people could just get on at midnight sitting on their couch watching TV and file a complaint and it would mostly be handled by technology, but there were still humans involved at every step of the way, but it was disaggregated, which made it easier for people. And one thing that they did when they first tested this was they did a small test and saw what the satisfaction of consumers was going through that process. And they regularly, every couple months, do a consumer satisfaction check to make sure that they know where they are and make sure that the work they're doing is increasing the humanity of their court system instead of decreasing the humanity or making it all just kind of dry and inhuman for them. So. Human touch is, is really important in any system you're going to be building like this. Um, yeah. Anything else to add on to that, Claudia or Sart? Uh, these last two principles that we talked about, human touch and cultural responsiveness, directly came out of the Diverse Voices Program, University of Washington's Information School and others with the testing that we went through. Um, they were not in the original principles. They are brand new and they um, are some of the most innovative pieces that have been put into this. Yeah, and on the on the human touch um, in New York, our pro bono net uh, has a chat a chat program that's training law students. And part of what what they're being trained, the law students, is you know that it's okay to respond to the person's emotion. Um, and in our blog, we just published an article about that. So if you're in a chat and somebody's ha expressing a, a really hard time, it's okay to say, I I hear how frustrating the system is. I am really sorry. Uh, I am looking for the materials, you know, to, I'm looking to find the resources that you want so that, you know, you keep, you know, that it is okay to be human. It's okay to recognize that the person may be really frustrated or in a really tight spot. Um, and so teaching, you know, this comes back to um, being self-aware, you know, that when you're responding or you're dealing or you're programming something that's going to respond, Sometimes it's okay to, to, to react with emotion or to mimic if it's, I would not recommend right now doing it with a robot, but take a look at our blog post because, um, you know, it's important that the, that the technology doesn't come across as dry and that if you're going to have people using the technology and they can somehow custom it, that it be done from an empathetic and a kindness point of view. How do you build kindness into these systems that are going to, be impacting, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million people a year. How do, how do you build a kindness into that and the human touch? And it's got to be, you know, in the support at the back end, chats, things like that. You can do that. You can do that if you train your team or the vendor trains their team really well. And it could be something really interesting to ask. How do you build human touch in your system? And someone asked what I meant by disaggregated. And so when I'm talking about a disaggregated court system, I mean, instead of everyone having to be in the room at the same time in a mediation or in the room at the same time in court dealing with this, hashing it out, disaggregated court systems make it so that people can have asynchronous communication. So I could get on midnight and file a claim and a day later when it's convenient for the person who's responding, they could respond and a judge can review it later. And if a judge has questions, they can send questions out and we can answer on our own time. It just it creates a much more human element to it because you're you're fitting into the lives of a person instead of forcing them to fit into some secondary structure. So that's what I mean by disaggregated. It's just making it simpler and um, less synchronized um, all in one place at the same time. So that takes us to uh, language. And oh, what do you have for us on that, Claudia? Yeah, actually, I really like the language access. Because if you look at the at the materials, it's I'm gonna read it because it's short. Because I believe that enough has been said that the the standards for courts have been out for for eight years, and CSC has been acting supporting state courts. So that the 
the standards are appropriately short, and they say courts should communicate in the preferred languages of people. Technology must be used in ways to enhance, which enhance communication, period. Right, so um, it's, it's very clear. If, if, if you have large pockets of the community that are speaking a particular language, that's how you should communicate, right? Otherwise, you're being ineffective, you know? And um, if the technology is not enhancing the communication, then what is it doing? And I will tell you that with the... With the COVID pandemic, right, a lot of, I was looking at this because I was getting increasingly frustrated. A lot of the schedules and everything were getting changed, right? And so I was looking across the state, like how were the courts um, letting the public know? And it was all legalese. Schedule A has been canceled. Motions are, you know, now moved to like this room or they have been canceled until, until the 30th. And... It was all written for lawyers, for insiders, everything about what's being heard, you know, and people were, and I was looking at this because in my back end, I was getting a lot of questions using our forms of people who didn't even know if they could file, if the courts were open, like the courts were shut down, nobody was picking up the phone. So I started looking at, okay, so what courts are creating really good instructions of what's going on in the scheduling that I can then give those links back to end users on LHI, which is not our function, but you know, people were really desperate. So not only were the instructions, and if you look at your county, we'd love to see what you think. They were not even for the public at large, much less in Spanish. And if you have a county where you have 60, 70, 80%, or even just 5% of your population that speak that other language, you should aim to communicate in the preferred language. That may also include um, sign language interpreting or some other way of communicating with the disabilities community. And so uh, this is um, appropriately short because, you know, everything else has been said about the legal obligation, about Title VI, about how courts are getting federal funds um, and what the standards are. And the standards apply to the online world and the standards apply to technology. We did that in 2012. Eight years later, how many of you have seen um, a move towards technology in multiple languages? Very few programs, my program, I'm proud to say, we support seven languages. But very few programs and courts are issuing forms and instructions and things like that in other languages. And that's just, you know, really a failure because we talk about access to justice. We get really caught up in arguments about regulatory reform that take two or three years to just pass, not even to see the results. We know how to do translations. We know how to do interpretation. It's easy, it's not rocket science, and really it's not that expensive, particularly when it's coded and it can be recycled. So why, why is it so hard? It's not. It's just a lack of awareness of what it is to not have any other mode of communication when you really need a final decision that's binding. So language access is very short because I think um, it's, it's gone to the point where it should not even be a question. Speaking of questions, we have a ton of really good questions. Um, but, and uh, Dora's going to read off some questions for us, but I want to start with the most important one on here that I saw is Sart, where do you get color changing cat ear headphones? <laughs> uh, these are uh, Razer uh, programmable um, LED headphones. So um, I, great fan of them. I borrowed them from, from my partner and then have just kept them kind of permanently. All right, wonderful. And I want to clarify, this is Devorah speaking, the moderator. I want to clarify one thing. The updated principles don't seem to be in the course materials. Don't worry, they will be there within two weeks. Your link remains the same. I think they're available through the court website, but you can just sit tight and use that link. Um, when we update with PowerPoint slides, we will also update with the um, updated principles. Sorry about that. Um, and I did respond to one of the questions. I responded as a send all with a link to the updated principles and the updated order on the court website. Thank They're you. up there on PDFs. 
Yeah, and we'll I work on the, the accessibility of the format. Article. I have the name of the article if people want to look it up. Can I read it out? Please do. Yes. It's usability testing results for legal icons, Northwest Justice Project, a case study, and it's on page 30 of the Future Trends in State Courts that's published by ncsc.org, National Center for State Courts. So I encourage people, you know, if you're going to be looking at iconography, take a look. But be aware that some of these icons that were tested are maybe already be available on the Trascent. And pretty much they are because um, I've seen them there in the Trascent webpage. Um, several people had asked about plain language related resources, and I sent a send all out to the uh, group also that included two resources. One of them is Transcend, and Transcend was the creator of a bunch of um, legal um, icons that are also available under a Creative Commons for people to use. Their resources and their trainings with regards to plain language and field testing are amazing. Um, and then I also put in their usability.gov, their tag for readability. Um, it talks about writing for the web, different interfaces, just extremely good resources uh, for learning to write in plain language. Has anybody Wonderful. asked us? Has anybody asked us about the recent tech principles from the courts? Someone uh, so did bring did up ask about uh, enforcement. Uh, yes. Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was going to say someone did bring up enforcement and like what the actual enforcement behind this is because there's no there's no punishment. It's just kind of a, a requirement, I guess, uh, and something that they can be reviewed and judged on. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, Claudia. So this is definitely a fascinating uh, question because originally pre-2004, um, these were floated as a access to justice technology bill of rights. Um, they were changed through the focus group and the collaborative process to be principles. Um, as far as I know, they have only been referenced in one um, case opinion. I wish I had that um, citation on me, um, but they were referenced there. Um, they've definitely been useful in the strategic and the planning phase of things. Um, if I was going to write uh, an appeal uh, where the current technology um, was used that was implemented via COVID disadvantaged and under um, served individual, um, I would definitely add these as a a reference there that the court system should be using technology um, that is accessible to individuals with diverse backgrounds or from diverse socioeconomic um, situations. Um, it does not create in and of itself um, a cause of action that I know of at this point. Um, I would personally love to see something uh, more enforceable, but these are on the side of collaboratively working with administrative office of the courts, working with court staff and others to try to prevent problems or to fix problems that have have arised, arisen. And someone did ask, and I don't know to the extent this is um, relevant to the topic today, but Claudia, picking up on what you said, maybe um, someone did ask how this, um, or pointed out that this might relate to the um, CLJ CMS, the that, is that another project sort of concurrently happening? And what is its relevance to the tech principles that you're discussing today? I don't know what those acronyms stand for, um, but I know the, 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 the CCJ. Courts the of Limited Jurisdiction Case Management System, is that? Yes. I don't know. I don't yeah, know what, we I don't... have talked with them. I, I can answer this, and we have talked with them as part of the Access to Justice Tech Committee, and they are aware of these principles, and we have worked with them. Right now, there is no advisory um, board yet, but we, as the Access to Justice Tech Committee, have worked with them to try to provide some guidance on these principles and how this, this new system should be implemented. So, yeah. Um. And but for a little bit I of clarity asked... for people that are interested in being in, involved in this type of stuff, the Access Justice Technology Committee um, that we are all on is under the Access to Justice Board. Um, and those uh, monthly or bi-monthly meetings are open to anyone. We are always looking for volunteers and help in this process. Um, whether it's you would like to suggest technologies that could be helpful as part of the best practices and um, sharing those with the community, um, or it's being involved with helping 
uh, improve a particular system. Um, the ATJ board has been very willing to um, write letters and reach out to try to fix inequities that are out there. No, what I was going to share is that the National Center for State Courts did re develop and release some um, technology principles um, for courts just before the ratification. I, I don't remember when. They may have been in May or maybe had, maybe were, it, it may have been sooner. It may have been in August, later in August. Those principles pretty much read like this, except that the Washington principles, in my humble opinion, are a little bit more advanced because these principles include things like usability. They include things like um, the privacy, right? And they also include, um, you know, um, the human touch. Those are unique to Washington, and I think that... Um, those are really, really, really important as technology advances. So um, the ones that the courts issued pretty much looked a lot like the 2004 that we want. I don't know if they looked at those and improved from them. I was not part of that process. But these and, these and those are pretty similar. But like the, the human touch, that's part of that's, – that's, that's, that's our – that's what we heard when we when when we went on the road and you know had a, a lot of support on that uh, cultural responsiveness. Also, Washington one. I don't think it's referred to to that like that in the other one. So um, I I believe that these Washington standards are, are principles are are raising the bar. And they also right, had Claudia, significant our, feedback from people outside of the um, justice system. Um, Microsoft and other tech companies were um, involved in sending individuals to consult and talk to people as part of the process. Um, so the Washington is in a unique position um, with so much emergent tech, and we did um, capitalize on those connections in talking to people about these. I was going to say, I know we've got 10 minutes, so Dora, we'll see if we can do some rapid fire questions here. What do you got for us? Okay, so we will not get to most of the questions, and I apologize. Um, could you speak a little bit about how these principles might now apply to our current public health crisis? Um, particularly, they were interested in balancing the public health with privacy, but you could also speak to it more generally. Well, I can yeah. tell you that I had like a ton of stress relief, not that I'm involved in any of it, but I do watch what's going on with technology and privacy when Zoom actually addressed their problems, right? Because uh, when, when everybody started going to Zoom as a go-to tool, um, there, were, there were a lot of concerns about, about privacy and anybody like being to Zoom bomb a meeting and stuff like that. So when, you know, that got addressed really fast by the vendor, it made me feel a lot better. Not that I'm involved in those processes, but uh, that's an example where people went and picked the technology without really understanding what the limitations were um, on protecting privacy, not just what options were available through the technology, but what the technology didn't do. So that's an example of kicking the tires. Right? So with, really making with... sure that you're asking the questions you need to ask before you, like, choose and pick a solution and move forward with it. And that's I know an example there's... of that. Go ahead. Oh, and I know there's been um, different discussions by individuals in um, which ways to use technology and put things like um, trials or hearings up online, um, whether that is a, a link that is only shared with the participants. Um, if that link, for example, um, if you can monitor who is actually viewing it, um, you can in real time respond. If that link has been shared more broadly and you have a lot of individuals viewing it, um, from geographically desperate locations, that type of thing. Um, so taking into consideration uh, these concerns, especially with privacy and accessibility when choosing technology vendors and then how to uh, respond in real time is very important. Um, but if, if those thoughts aren't really put forward at the beginning of the process, um, someone's uh, privacy is going to be hurt before you end up with a response. 
And the Brennan Center actually has published a report about this from a core point of view based on surveys that they did on COVID, and they did highlight some of the things that they found. Like, for example, they found that um, eviction eviction hearings, um, the majority of people they surveyed found those to be cruel to be done online. You know, the, you know, basically that, that, that was a finding on their survey. The other thing that they found was that... Um, it was important that the courts allow lawyers and clients to talk before or during without there being any recording or intrusion into those conversations because if the lawyer and the client are not in the same hearing room or conference room, you know, settlement room, there has to be a way that they can still communicate if there's going to be adequate representation of counsel, right, because there may be the need to be able to step out of the virtual room where everybody is and make sure that nobody from the court or from the other side can see that conversation. So setting up time before, setting up time after, those kind of things. You know, I know that Zoom also did improve their ability to have um, interpreters and, and, and record that. So thinking through, you know, in COVID, if you're doing hearings, um, which, you know, and you're keeping, you're keeping the recording in Spanish, how do you store that in the record? Because now it's part of the record, right? Where before it was oral interpretation, now you may have a video recording. So how do you store that? How do you give that access if anybody should ever ask for that? Like thinking through that. Um, so those are examples from the pandemic. And I think that the, you know, the most important thing is really um, testing. You know, if you set up a system, I, I, I just did a talk with the ABA. I think that everybody has been amazing, amazingly creative. A lot of hearings and a lot of things are happening now, and I'm very thankful to the energy and creativity to get things rolling back. I think that at some point, you know, people need to stop and think, okay, what is going to be permanent and what is not? And if it's going to be permanent, how is it going to be done and designed? Because I think that most honestly, a lot of systems are operating on emergency band-aid just because people needed to get going. But at some point, there has to be a stop and look at how is this technology, how is this, um, looking at what Brennan said in the report. How do we build, you know, include due process and procedural fairness and all of that? Because I think that, you know, a lot of those things were not thought out. There was no time. Just because remote hearings had not been adopted as a matter of practice. Now, it, um, one of the projects that I'm working on is the um, clinics through Eastside Legal Assistance um, project, and they have moved 40 clinics online, um, and they are, um, in response to the pandemic and what's going on, um, doing focus groups with the lawyers that are providing services in those clinics um, to ask them about um, their experiences, what could be improved, those type of things. Um, but they're taking this um, period of time uh, to evaluate as they put in new technology. Um, hopefully we'll be doing the same thing um, with uh, past clients of the clinic also um, to look at that. But this particular time period has pushed a lot of individuals to adopt very quickly a lot of technologies that they weren't familiar with beforehand. So we need to start that iterative process of user testing, improving, deciding which ones to keep. And some of them are going to cause harms, which ones we want to um, avoid or improve upon and why. I am excited for the technological growth during this time period. That's, Wonderful, that's thank you. That's bold and great. You know, I mean, there's, you know, there's no reason we could not like be making it easier and cheaper for people that have the the the, the lowest income to to access justice through technology and remote workflows. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, maybe two, depending. Um, somebody asked, uh, someone says the, uh, that they admire the sensitivity of these norms and wish they were mirrored in the substantive law and process as a whole. Does this discrepancy potentially raise false expectations for the clients that people are working with? Yes, I love that question. 
uh, because yes, it absolutely, unfortunately does. These tech principles are looking forward uh, to where we need to go and we are not there right now. And so I think that discrepancy is very real. And I hope that as legal consumers start to notice that discrepancy, they will start to demand better from our court systems, from the laws that are written. Um, yeah, that is the hope that, that that will help push us faster because the thing that will really push us faster is if there is demand for these things to change because people see what it should be and that we're not there yet. I, I'll definitely say thank you for having that as the last question. And there, there is a real challenge in the justice system, uh, especially with our limited um, budgets. And we need to embrace what um, the accountability and fairness principle talks about, which is um, that we need to look for that uh, those inequitable processes, those unfair outcomes, those unintended negative impacts, um, and improve upon them. There is a discrepancy between um, what we would like and the justice that is being served now through technology, and we're here to improve that. I agree with that. So really thank you for having us and for letting us share um, our our insights on this, and these are aspirational. This is this is the world we we. These are the the world that we want to be based on the values um, that we that we have as a community of justice. So hopefully, some of you will find this inspirational. May want to participate in the working group if you're here, and um, and if you're in a different state, you know, consider bringing it up and seeing if if others in your communities are interested in this. I think that if we if we say these are this is where we want to be with technology, we will eventually. I mean, you, any path will do if, like the Cheshire Cat said, right? Any path will do if you don't know where you're going. That's why he's smiling, right? Anything will do if you don't know where you're going. But if you know where you're going, you're gonna get there, and you will find the path to get there, even if you don't know what the path is. And so this is a time where with COVID, with the pandemic with the realization how important remote workflows are, how important technology is, this is the time to really think long-term and strategically. So thank you. <laughs>